You can support In the Past Lane by buying some of our merchandise, like shirts, hoodies, mugs, and stickers. Just go to our website, inthepastlane.com. Thanks. There was always something sketchy about Aaron Burr. The whiff of corruption, double-dealing, and scandal followed him in life right to the very end. Seriously, in 1833, at the age of 77, he married a wealthy widow named Eliza Jumel. Months later, she accused Burr of infidelity and stealing her fortune, and sued for divorce. Her attorney? None other than Alexander Hamilton Jr., son of the man Burr killed in their famous duel in 1804. As fate would have it, Eliza Jamel's divorce was granted on September 14th, 1836, the same day that Aaron Burr died. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 88, in which we look at one of the great scandals from the early republic, a scandal led by one of the great scoundrels of the early republic, Aaron Burr. We are coming to you this week from the Blennerhassett Island Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Highlighting us along, as always, is our marvelous executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So, what's happening at In the Past Lane this week? In a word, summer vacation is over. Or as we say around here, it's over. These days, it's full-on prep for the semester and, cue the scary music, my new job as chair of the history department. So far, so good. In other news, we have four more patrons of the podcast. Thanks to Michelle G., Matt J., Wanda L., for becoming monthly patrons of the podcast via Patreon. And thanks to John F., who helped out with a generous donation via good old-fashioned check. All this support means that I have indeed reached my first goal, a level of monthly support that will allow me to send out one episode per month to be edited and formatted by a professional editing service. Huzzah! This will save me a ton of time and allow me to keep the podcast going. So many, many thanks to all of you supporters. I really appreciate it. I hope more of you will consider supporting the podcast. The next goal is to fund the editing of two episodes per month. And you can help out with a donation of as little as $1 a month. Just go to inthepastlane.com and click on support. Thanks. Okay, all that's left for me to say is, please subscribe to the podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. And tell your friends about it. Thanks. Okay, people, cue the Hamilton soundtrack. We're on the prowl for Aaron Burr. Your journey in the past lane begins now. Aaron Burr. We all know Aaron Burr was, as his character says in Hamilton, the musical, the damn fool who in 1804 shot and killed Alexander Hamilton. More specifically, Burr was the sitting vice president who shot the former secretary of treasury in a duel resulting from a personal feud. Think about it. That's the equivalent of Vice President Mike Pence killing former Secretary of the Treasury Tim Geithner or Jack Lew. Amazingly, Aaron Burr went back to Washington, D.C. and finished out his term, leaving office in March of 1805. One of the statements by Hamilton about Burr that contributed to their feud and duel was Hamilton's warning that Burr had no morals and was a man driven by pure ambition. To one friend, Hamilton wrote, As to Burr, there is nothing in his favor. His private character is not defended by his most partial friends. He is bankrupt beyond redemption except by the plunder of his country. His public principles have no other spring or aim than his own aggrandizement 
If he can, he will certainly disturb our institutions to secure himself permanent power and with it wealth. He is truly the Catiline of America. Catiline, of course, was a nefarious character from the early days of the Roman Republic. Hamilton later wrote to another friend that Burr's ambition for power was boundless. He was, said Hamilton, sanguine enough to hope everything, daring enough to attempt everything, wicked enough to scruple nothing. So was Hamilton right? Was Burr a power-hungry demon? His critics would say yes. And for evidence, they'd point not only to his killing of Hamilton, his chief political rival, but also to the bizarre plot he got involved in just months after leaving office in 1805. To this day, scholars are divided in their assessment of just what Aaron Burr was up to in 1806-1807. We do know that Burr headed out to the recently acquired Louisiana Purchase Territory and began recruiting men and building ships for some sort of expedition. Some evidence suggests that Burr was planning to launch a military campaign to break off a chunk of the United States from the lower half of the Louisiana Purchase, plus some of Spanish Mexico, to essentially create an independent nation with himself as its emperor. And there's evidence that Burr was floating variations of this scheme by British officials, urging them to support it. And there's ample evidence that this scheme also had the backing of General James Wilkeson, the highest-ranking officer in the United States military. For his part, Burr claimed he was merely assembling men and equipment to establish a colony in the new territories. In any case, as we will hear in my conversation with historian James E. Lewis Jr., the significance of the alleged Burr conspiracy rested not on whether or not it actually existed, but the fact that people believed that it did. As a result, the Burr conspiracy contributed to a major crisis in the early republic, one that suggested the young and fragile American experiment was on the verge of collapse. This incident is a vivid reminder of just how dicey things were for the United States in its earliest days. If you remember my interview with Carol Birkin in episode 28 of In the Past Lane, the 1790s were marked by bitter political feuding, vicious partisan media, and social unrest that nearly plunged the young nation into civil war. Then, in 1804, Burr killed Hamilton. Then, just two years later, the alleged Burr conspiracy was uncovered. Five years later, in 1812, the United States went to war against Great Britain for a second time. Two years after that, in 1814, the British attacked Washington, D.C. and burned the White House. It's worth keeping these incidents in mind when we think about the early republic. The founders may have set up a remarkable political system based on the Constitution, but there was no guarantee that it would succeed. Indeed, the founders were keenly aware that all previous attempts at republican government had failed. This historical awareness, plus the context of near-constant political turmoil, made the crisis of the Burr Conspiracy of 1806-1807 an alarming and consequential event that we need to know a lot more about. Don't go anywhere, people. In the Past Lane, a podcast about history and why it matters. We'll be right back. All right, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, back at In the Past Lane. And with me now is James E. Lewis, Jr. He is a professor of history at Kalamazoo College. Lewis has published a number of essays and four books on the diplomacy, politics, and political culture of the early American Republic. And it's my pleasure to speak with him today about his latest work, The Burr Conspiracy, Uncovering the Story of an Early American Crisis, published by Princeton University Press. James E. Lewis, Jr., welcome to In the Past Lane. Thank you for having me. My first question is, what drew you to this topic, this conspiracy or alleged conspiracy led by Aaron Burr? I suspect that you were not inspired by Hamilton the musical, or even more so by recent concerns about conspiracies and possible treasonous actions or allegations thereof by members of the Trump team. So tell us how you got to this topic probably a good while ago. Yeah, so it would have had to have been very prescient to have figured out where the book was actually going to arrive in terms of contemporary politics and culture. <laughs> actually, it came out of my first book project, which was on the American Union, the Union of the States, and the response to the breakup of the Spanish Empire between the 1780s and the 1820s. And, and that was very much an external challenge to the American Union. And I kind of got through that and I thought, well, you know, what about the internal challenges? to the Union of the States in the same period, and landed on the Burr Conspiracy, which had kind of been seen as a huge challenge at the time, and, and a number of historians had written about it in those terms. And so I just went from there, and that was, I really started identifying this as my next big project in the late 90s, 20 years ago. 
Okay, so long before Lin-Manuel Miranda and all of that. Well, so why don't we, in terms of diving into the topic itself, begin with, I think because of Hamilton the musical, a lot of people at least basically know that he's the guy who shot Alexander Hamilton. But maybe you could start by providing our audience with a little more background on who this guy, Aaron Burr, was leading up to the duel. And the, and then we'll treat that as kind of the pivot point to diving into the conspiracy. Burr was from a, a very well-respected family, so uh, which already makes him quite different from Hamilton. And he, in some ways, was like Hamilton. They both got involved in the American Revolution very early on. They both rose pretty quickly. They both were seen as significant contributors to the process. Where Hamilton stayed in General Washington's good graces, though, throughout the war, Berg fell out a bit, and there were some frictions there. This was not at all uncommon in the officer corps in the Revolution. Mm -hmm. And then got involved, uh, he was a lawyer, involved in, with the law in New York. And then in the 1790s, uh, under the new government of the Constitution, he began to be involved in politics, New York state politics and New York City politics in particular, in a way that increasingly led him away from Hamilton, who was, Hamilton was the leader really of what's called the Federalist Party, and Burr became increasingly involved in what was called the Republican Party or Democratic Republican Party. And that's where he really came to sort of a national fame. Uh, he was one of the people who received attention in the 1796 election, the election that ended in Adams being the president. But then leading up to the next election, he was very actively involved in bringing the Republican Party over to Thomas Jefferson, particularly in New York City, and therefore in New York State, and really helped to win the election for the Republicans. And for his efforts, in part, was really, it's easy to impose artificial categories on it. We would now say he was the vice presidential candidate, right. Jefferson's ticket. That's really not right. Yeah, it didn't quite work that way in those days. Yeah, they, they were both running... And that was, I think most Republicans at the time would have said, okay, that's the intention, is that Jefferson will be the president and Burr will be the vice president. But the election ended with them tied in terms of electoral votes, and it was actually had to go to the House of Representatives to decide which of them would be the president. And that produced a lot of bad blood between Burr and Jefferson and, and really many of the leading Republicans, so that over the four years of his vice presidency, he was increasingly adrift from the party that he had in some ways helped to build and certainly had helped bring to power. And that led him right on the threshold of the duel to decide to run for governor of New York and to do so in a way that tried to court Federalist voters. And this is where a lot of the final buildup with Hamilton leading up to the duel kicks in. And of course, at the time of the duel, he was still the vice president. He returned to the vice presidential chair in the Senate, presiding officer of the Senate in the late fall of 1804 and remained in office until you know, the constitutionally appointed term ended in early March of 1805. That part of it is always quite remarkable that uh, with all the furor and be actually being indicted both for murder and for the charge of dueling, charges that never result in any kind of conviction, he just, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say he saunters back to Washington, but he is in Washington in full plain view until his term expires uh, months later. Oh, yeah. So he does leave office in March of 1805, and you know the next story, the big story that you focus on in your book, really comes right on the heels yeah. of him leaving office. He seems to have an immediate plan. And so what's he, what's he up to in 1805, 1806? He's very active in the recently acquired Louisiana Territory, the Ohio Valley, upstate New York, uh, in western New York, I should say. So there's some things we do know, and we definitely know where he was and, to a large degree, the things he was doing. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we know a lot more about where he was, his movements, and some of the people he was meeting with than what the ultimate goal of, of all this activity was. But he spent the summer of 1805 and the fall, really, of 1805 touring almost the entirety of the West, the West at this point being primarily the region between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River, though he also went to St. Louis. He also went into other parts of what would become the state of Louisiana. So he's all over the place. He's meeting in many places with the people who are somewhat disaffected from the Jefferson administration, but that's not a universal truth. In Kentucky, he's well in with the people who are very much the supporters of the current administration, but he's traveling everywhere. He's meeting with people. The rumors are saying that he's got four, five, six different things in mind, some of them perfectly laudable, like helping to organize a company to build a canal around the falls of the Ohio River at Louisville, and some of them much more dubious, 
possibly raising a court to go against Spanish Mexico or Spanish Florida, and possibly even a plan of dividing the United States at the Appalachian Mountains and setting up some kind of empire of his own west of the mountains. And the primary evidence for that is that he does seem to be recruiting people and gathering, you know, men and ordering the building of boats and raising of supplies. So it's not just that wherever he goes, there's this whiff of conspiracy. He does seem to be doing something. And the question is, as you note, it's enveloped in mystery, to quote your passage, that what his intentions and in all three, four, five possible explanations seem to have to be plausible. So you note that his explanation is that he's just simply planning to create a settlement or a colony in the Louisiana territory or perhaps in Spanish-held Texas. But there are these other possibilities that he's going to divide the country in half and basically turn that west of the Appalachians territory into his own nation that he will dominate. Right. What are some of the other scenarios? Well, there are enough tensions with Spain at this moment, particularly over the Louisiana Purchase, which the Spanish did not believe was legitimate at all. They had transferred Louisiana back to France with the understanding that it couldn't be sold to anyone, particularly to the United States. And so there were enough tensions with Spain that it was plausible that what he really wanted to do was to get men ready to go to war with Spain if a war broke out. So that's one way of saying it. The other is that he was going to go to war with Spain even without a war breaking out, and that his intention was to conquer Mexico or Florida for himself. There were certainly these ideas that he wanted to settle land, and and there was a purchase of a shadowy claim to a chunk of the Louisiana territory, Louisiana Purchase territory, in 1806 that made that seem somewhat plausible. There were people who talked about, you know, maybe he's just going out to the West to restart politically, and he's going to come back to Washington as the territorial delegate from one of these places or a senator from Tennessee, for example. So it's a real range of possibilities. And the range narrows as he does, particularly in a second tour of the West in 1806, he does start to have people building boats for him. He starts to stockpile supplies, at least foodstuffs and and some other supplies. And he starts to have what seem to be his agents in upstate New York, in western Pennsylvania, in Ohio, in Kentucky, in Tennessee, who are recruiting men for him. And this is um, something that later in the century is going to be actually a not surprising thing with filibustering and and these sort of private invasion armies. But this is certainly one of the first, if in fact that's what it was. And it's always important to place ourselves in the context of what's going on. This seems incredibly treasonous, incredibly dangerous. But there are lots of people in America in 1805 who would not be upset by a an attempt to expand the territorial boundaries of the U.S. by invading, you know, one of these neighboring colonial powers. Right, and that wouldn't have been treason, right? There were laws against that, but certainly it would not have been a treasonous offense to have done that. And treason would have been dividing the Union. It would have been um, making war against the United States. And that could have taken the big form of trying to divide the United States. It could have taken a smaller form of making war on the new U.S. possessions around New Orleans, seizing the American fort there, seizing the Bank of the United States, which had just founded a new branch there. So that would have arguably been treason as well, and not just the act of really saying, okay, I'm now at war with the United States. So as this all unfolds rather incredibly in 1806, as men are being gathered, ships are being constructed, initially word starts to come back to the Jefferson administration that this is happening, and there's some alarm on the part of local officials in places like Kentucky saying this is, this is nefarious. This is not just a colonizing expedition. This is something larger that threatens the U.S. And initially, Jefferson sort of pooh-poohs these reports, but then fairly quickly, he and his cabinet begin to take them seriously and begin to take action. So tell us about how that turns and how it ultimately leads to the stymieing of this expedition that's floating down the Mississippi River. Sure. There had been warnings coming in as early as February of 1806 from the West, from the federal district attorney in Kentucky, which seems like a source who deserves a lot of credit, but he happened to be a federalist, and that raised some red flags in Jefferson's mind. But by the late summer of 1806, it started to be much more in the newspapers, and it also started to come in from people that Jefferson had more faith in, Republicans in upstate New York, Republicans in western Pennsylvania, Republicans in Ohio, 
That news convinced Jefferson, look, I got to go to the cabinet. We've got to come up with what our response to this is going to be. And so there was a run of three cabinet meetings in late October 1806, where they really sort of decided what their initial response was going to be. And it really wasn't a whole lot. And this is one of the things that Federalists would, within a few weeks, be shocked about when it became clear how little the administration had decided to do in the context of what much of the country was worried about and genuinely concerned about. The most important thing he did was to send a federal agent, a special agent, west, sort of on Burr's trail to accumulate information and to send it back to Washington, but also to work with the state governors and territorial governors in the West if Burr did anything that could permit a legal response, allow for him to be arrested or or stopped in some way. And that ultimately did pay off. This agent, John Graham, arrived in Ohio with enough information that he got the Ohio governor and legislature to send the militia who seized a large quantity of Burr's boats and also Burr's supplies. So that somewhat diminishes this expedition, but it does ultimately begin to move down the the two Uh main tributaries. And we should also point out there's a second location, not just Ohio, but Blennerhassett Island. Blennerhassett himself is one of these very interesting, colorful characters that you can't make up who offers his island and some of his resources to Burr as kind of a staging ground. Tell us a little bit about him and how this factors into this expedition as it unfolds. Yeah, he he really is a fascinating person. He was Irish uh, and had come to the United States in the 1790s. That was not at all uncommon. A lot of uh, Irish radicals had been driven out of Ireland by British oppression, English oppression in the 1790s. He's really not one of those, though he's often thought of as one of those. He was driven out as much by family issues, but he arrived in America with a lot of money, and he wanted to live this sort of quintessential life of a rural retreat away from the cares of the world. And he bought a big chunk of an island in the Ohio River downstream from Marietta, Ohio, and from what's now Parkersburg, West Virginia, which was just a small little community in Virginia at the time. And yes, that became one of the key areas for collecting Burr's men, boats, and supplies. Blennerhassett and Burr contracted together to have boats built at Marietta. Those are the ones that Ohio seized. But there were also men coming down from north of Pittsburgh who arrived at Blennerhassett Island and were just narrowly got out of it before the Ohio militia and sort of a volunteer company from the Virginia side of the river showed up to grab them in early mid-December of 1806. Burr was not with that group, though. Burr was with a second group of boats and men that had formed up in Nashville, and they floated down the Cumberland River and connected, which connects with the Ohio. And so the two groups met up at the mouth of the Cumberland on the Ohio River. And from there, they proceed further south. And at a certain point, Burr and his entourage realize that Jefferson has, I believe this is right, put out an arrest warrant for him. And they stop somewhere north of Natchez and effectively turn themselves in? It's not exactly an arrest warrant. It was a presidential proclamation that said, there's something up in the West didn't even name Burr, but told the people, if you have sort of been duped into being a part of this, thinking that the governments behind it were not, uh, and get out of it, distance yourself from it, and also told federal officials and state officials to be on guard for this, to keep an eye out for any illegal activity. And that was apparently enough to convince Burr that whatever his plans were, they weren't going to happen at that moment. And so he left his men on the Louisiana side, what's now the Louisiana side of the river, and went to the Mississippi side of the river and surrendered to civil authorities. And that's not the trial that becomes the trial uh, shortly thereafter. No, it's not the trial. There is a trial there, and there had already been a couple of trials in Kentucky. None of these have enough evidence to find him guilty of anything. But after the trial in Natchez in the Mississippi Territory, he heads out east across what's now eastern Mississippi and into western Alabama. And it's not really clear where he was going. There are two possibilities. He I would later say that he was going to Washington, D.C. to surrender himself there to clear his name. It's probably not the most direct route, but it's clear that he wanted to stay out of New Orleans. Mm-hmm. But the other possibility is that he's actually going to Spanish territory because the Spanish owned Florida at this point and really owned the whole Gulf Coast all the way to the Mississippi River, including north of New Orleans, and that he might have been going to some place like Mobile or Pensacola 
to turn himself over to the Spanish or come under Spanish protection or even find some way of leaguing with the Spanish mm-hmm. in order to carry on his plans. And that's where he's actually arrested. He's, he's recognized north of Mobile and arrested in February of 1807, and from there taken overland three or so week journey almost to D.C., and then word comes from the administration, we don't want him here, we want him in Richmond. And that's where the famous trial happens, the the one that we think of as the Burr trial. Right. And before the trial begins, two things happen. One is that President Thomas Jefferson makes a public statement that Burr is, without a doubt, guilty of treason. I mean, basically inserting himself into the judicial process. And second, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, John Marshall, is named the judge to preside over Burr's trial. So tell us about how this trial plays out. The trial went through multiple stages. In some ways, the key moment came in late June when Burr and six others were indicted on the charge of treason and also on the misdemeanor of raising an army to wage war against a power that the United States was at peace with, in this case, Spain. So the next phase is the treason phase, and that's the one that begins in in August 1807. And throughout this process, it had been Chief Justice Marshall really in charge of the trial. Marshall was very shocked that the grand jury could come back with treason indictments against these men, and particularly against Burr, that the indictment spelled out very clearly, it had to, where the crime took place and when the crime took place. And it said that the crime took place, the crime of treason, took place on uh, December 10th or December 11th, 1806, on Blennerhassett Island in the Ohio River, and Burr wasn't there. And so part of what Marshall is trying to decide throughout the summer and part of what the defense attorneys are trying to show throughout the trial is that he couldn't have been guilty of treason because he simply wasn't at the spot where this allegedly treasonous action had taken place. Mm-hmm. And this is a, it was really an English doctrine, English common law doctrine called constructive treason. And the question was, does that apply in the new United States? And Marshall ultimately decided, no, it does not. The Constitution is extremely clear on what constitutes treason in the United States. And it's two things, levying war against the United States or giving aid and comfort to the nation's enemies. The United States was at peace. It didn't have any enemies. So the only thing that Burr and the others could have done would have been to have levied war against the United States. And Marshall ultimately decided that that simply had not happened. But even before that kind of final decision, he decided that Even if they can later prove it did happen, Burr wasn't there. He couldn't have been a part of it, even if he was in some ways involved in getting the men together, getting the boats together, getting whatever arms they may have had purchased for them. So it's a very important legal case, Mm -hmm. apart from just all the sensation uh, that surrounds it. And Burr walks away. Right. And we should turn now to part of your argument and really the seems to be the central focus of your book, which is that there's been a lot written on this topic, many, many books from the moment the trial concluded. People have been writing about it. And right. as you point out, the focus of much of this writing has always been on what was he up to? Like, what can we figure out what's in Burr's head, what's in you know Jefferson's head, and this sort of thing, and a real focus on the legal process and right. on the big players. And the fact is there's just not much evidence that will ever, unless something is discovered, uh, you know, a diary or something, will right. let us know what they were thinking. And your focus, therefore, is on the wider, like how, what the crisis meant to the nation at the time. And that's indicated very clearly in the subtitle uh, of the book, which is a story of an early American crisis, not a story of an early American plot. And that the point being that whether or not there was a plot is almost in some ways irrelevant in the same way that it didn't really matter if there were witches in Salem or Soviet spies in 1950s America. It's just that people believed these things and acted upon those beliefs. So tell us about this focus that you have and what you found about, like, what did Americans think about this alleged conspiracy? And what does this tell us about the early republic? And how does it shape the politics of that era? Yeah, this became, in some ways, of necessity, what I wrote about, because I I couldn't find the evidence to write answers to the old questions. Nobody had ever been able to, and everybody had always said, we don't really know, but here's what I think. And that just... To do that again and to to offer my thoughts didn't seem to advance the issue very far, even though in in many ways I think I've done more research than than anybody who came before me who's written on this. What I became fascinated with, though, is why people decided that there was such a threat. Why did they allow these 
conflicting reports, these sort of open-ended rumors, these uh, movements that didn't necessarily add up to anything other than, uh, you know, I don't have anything keeping me here. I'm going to travel through the West. Why did they allow that to reach the level of a crisis? What were they afraid of? And what do those fears tell us about this period of American history? We're talking 20 years after the Constitution. We're talking 40 years after the Declaration of Independence. What were they worried about? And it, in fact, uh, once you take that set of questions and you replace the old questions about you know, what a handful of people really thought with these broader questions about why were Americans so worried? How did they learn about this? And how did their fears then shape their ability to say, okay, here's what Burr is up to. I mean, they put the man on trial for his life. That's right. And they right. did that on the basis of these very uncertain and conflicting accounts. How did they arrive at that level of confidence after being so uncertain for so long about what this all meant? And that led me to this whole realm of fears about how stable the union of the states was, how I mean, this was a, an experiment, and this experiment had failed in the past. And every past example they could point to, federal unions had failed. And they were very worried about it. They had been very worried about it going back to the revolution when the union was even less formal, but was necessary in order to, to defeat the British. Right. They have a keen sense of history when it comes to Republican government. They, they really understand they it did. as a fragile thing that ultimately is done in. And so part of their thinking all the time leading up to this crisis has been, how do we, you know, fend off these things? We, you know, we can't have a standing army. Right. We have to be vigilant about electing virtuous people to office and so forth. So this kind of fear is longstanding. Yeah. Republican government seems very fragile. Federal union seems very fragile. They look at themselves and they see the kinds of people who have historically destroyed these governments, governmental structures. And they worry about not just the external fears that I had studied in my first book, but they also worry about these internal sources of anxiety. You know, there are people right here who are ambitious, like Burr, who have no principles, as Burr seemed not to have any principles who would be happy to jump on board something that would allow them, as one uh, put it, to dip their hands in Mexican gold, mm -hmm. right? They're greedy people, there are ambitious people, and they aren't going to uh, scruple to destroy this experiment in Republican government and federal union if they can advance their own personal interests. And that, to me, was very interesting, to see how pervasive these anxieties were, and then how, in a sense knowing what could happen, shaped their understanding of what was happening. They had slots to put this information mm -hmm. into that fit into a master narrative. And the master narrative was the union in peril, the republic in peril, and imperiled by these kinds of people. So they, they took their information, they discarded stuff that didn't fit with their pre-existing story. They kept the stuff that did, and that allowed them to get through the, the sense of being enveloped in mystery to for much of the country, a sense uh, of confidence that Jefferson was right when he said that Burr's guilt was beyond question. It is. It's beyond question. Now, there were other people who totally rejected that and said that, no, no, Jefferson is trying to destroy a former political rival, a potential future political rival. Burr's totally innocent. But they were equally certain, right? They, mm -hmm. they had gone from confused to equally certain, and I wanted to see how that process played out. So a lot of this book is about a process of making sense. And this, I think, is where, in some ways, the contemporary relevance is very powerful, because we're always in this situation, but it's not equally clear at all moments. But here's a moment we live in today where people are have facing a swirl of information, conflicting information about a handful of very important issues, and are trying to sort through it, but you know, we don't all sort through it by spending thousands of hours on it. Many of us sort through it by having a voice, a station, a newspaper that we have, have kind of historically trusted and that when they say, okay, this is what's going on, we're willing to say, okay, I think that's right. That makes sense of the evidence that I've seen. Maybe it doesn't make sense of every little piece of evidence, but you know that stuff can be explained away and that's my story now too. And I'm not going to keep agonizing over every new piece of information because I've got my story now and it makes sense to me. Right. And then back in 1806, 1807, your book focuses quite a bit on the on the role of media and on partisan press. Yeah. These newspapers were explicitly and openly partisan. They said, we are a Republican newspaper. We are a Federalist newspaper. Right. And so in a much more 
200 years ago version of, of news, they really helped shape that narrative, uh, right. both for the people that saw Burr as guilty and those who thought he was being essentially framed. So that is a real, one of those continuums that we see right up to the present day. What else about the alleged conspiracy and then the trial is important to know just from that time period itself? Well, I do think that you're right that this has always been seen as an important trial for defining what treason is in America, and it's worth paying attention to it for that reason. It's also uh, interesting, I think, to us. We have had our share of uh, huge sort of trial of the century celebrity trials in recent decades. And I think our tendency is to think that they're a new phenomenon, that they couldn't have happened without mass media, that they couldn't have happened without you know, the 24-hour news cycle or whatever, cable. And that's not true. The Burr trial of 1807 was huge. In nearly all of the newspapers of the day, it drew people who were beyond celebrity. I mean, the former vice president of the United States, the chief justice of the United States, Some of the most important members of Congress from Virginia were involved in this as grand jurors or even as jurors later on. And this was a huge thing that for particularly for the spring of 1807 during its early phases, the country in some ways shut down to find out what was going on, what was being revealed from Richmond and whether it was bigger than Burr, whether the Spanish were involved or the British were involved, whether the U.S. Army, we kind of dropped the name Wilkinson a couple of times. Wilkinson, James Wilkinson, was the commanding general of the United States Army. He ended up being the most important evidence against Burr, but there was also good reason at the time to think he had, in fact, been involved with Burr. And the reason he had good evidence was that he had been a co-conspirator with Burr in whatever this grand design was. So how far was it going to go? So this was a huge thing, and it, I think, forces us to understand that it doesn't take the 24-hour news cycle and cable TV to have a trial with the, the kind of resonance, the popular resonance, that we think of as the celebrity trial, the trial of the century. I had a professor who once said, there's nothing new in history, and I've always <laughs> re- reminded of, of that fact. Well, I'm really tempted to ask you this question, and you can dodge it if you wish or not answer it, but you didn't necessarily go into this trying to figure out what Burr was up to. But do you have a sense, like just even just a, a sense of, you know, was he up to something or up to many things and kind of, you know, going to see which card he would play? I mean, because Burr, Burr was kind of a nefarious or certainly a character people didn't trust well before this conspiracy. And, you know, scandal sort of followed him the the rest of his days in many ways. So do you have a sense of what he was up to? Not that it necessarily matters to the argument that you're making in your book. I don't feel that comfortable saying what I think he was up to. I think it's very interesting that they didn't know at the time and that it's still so hard for us to know later. And part of this comes Mm -hmm. down to Burr himself and the way that you were suggesting. He was known as a man of ambition, so it was easy to believe a lot about him. But he was also known as a man, there were, there are a number of uh, people whose diaries or letters I saw, he said, you know, I spent hours with the vice president today, and I, I felt like we were having a very full, rich conversation. But when I sit down after it, I don't actually know what he thought about anything. Mm-hmm. Right? He was the kind of person who could make you feel like you were involved in uh, this very revealing discussion about political issues, and yet, ultimately, you never really knew what he thought. You know, when you think about why don't we know what Burr thought, well, there is an evidentiary issue. We don't have a lot of evidence that apparently existed at the time and the the various explanations for why it it no longer exists. But the evidence we do have, and we have plenty of evidence from people who sat down with Burr, talked with Burr about his plans, is very contradictory and is very guarded. And part of that is because these people were trying to guard their own reputation. They didn't want to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we talked about this union. But part of it is also that they were never entirely sure what Burr intended, whether he had lots of cards in play, as you suggested. You know, is he going into this and saying, okay, if I can do it, I'm going to break up the union. If I can't do that, I'm going to attack Spanish Mexico. If I can't do that, I'll attack Spanish Florida. If I can't do that, then I'll settle for this colony in eastern, what's now eastern Louisiana. That's not out of the question at all. If you look at what the people who thought they were participating in his plans say, they say lots of different things. One of the ones that I was struck by, though, is how many of them said something along the lines of something that added up to, we're going to conquer Mexico, and it is going to be an independent nation. So Blenner Hassett says, at one point in his diary, I was going to be the ambassador to Great Britain. 
that was going to be my reward for backing this from the beginning mm-hmm. and putting money behind it. He could only be the ambassador to Great Britain if there's an independent something that Burr's in charge of. Right. So ultimately, as you say, we have to go by evidence, and the evidence is unclear and probably will remain so yes. forever. Well, this has been a a great discussion. Your book is really fascinating and tells us a lot about the early republic and also about the the politics and media and, you know, the inner thinking of of people when it came to what was then a very young, uncertain republic and uh, how the Burr trial really, I guess, forced all that out into the open and with many, many parallels to our current time talking of uh, political scandals and allegations of treason. So thanks so much, James. This has been a really terrific discussion. It's been wonderful. Thank you. James E. Lewis Jr. is the author of The Burr Conspiracy, Uncovering the Story of an Early American Crisis, published by Princeton University Press and available everywhere. Okay, people, that's all for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about the many things we talked about today, head over to our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever you access your podcasts. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Okay, Lulu, people want to know, if you had to choose a superpower, would it be to turn invisible or to fly? Neither. I want the power to vaporize people who annoy me. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 